You're doing a heck of a job. It's a heck of a show with Michael Brown. You're on the radio. On KOA News Radio. Okay, let's get a couple of housekeeping things uh, out of the way, uh, just to let you know kind of what we're doing between now and, uh, well, Friday. We're on the air one hour tonight. We're on the air one hour Wednesday night. We won't be here Tuesday, Thursday, Friday. Isn't that right, Angie? I think that's right. Yes. Okay, I think, I'm, pre- I'm pretty sure that's right. So, a couple of housekeeping things. First, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm begging you. I'm begging you to go to koanewsradio.com. koanewsradio.com. And over there on the left-hand side, side, you will see On Air. When you click On Air, you'll see the program schedule, and right down there is my little old name, Michael Brown. And you're going to click that, and when you click that, you'll, well, first of all, you'll see my mugshot. It's the same one that you see in the post office, so don't, be, don't like avert your gaze when you go to that page, because it's the same picture you see every time you go to the post office. Who goes to the post office anymore? And by the way, if you go to the post office, do they still have the wanted signs up? Like the FBI's top 10 most wanted goobers or something? I I've don't seen know. that at Walmart. You've seen it at Walmart? Yeah. The top 10 most wanted at Walmart? Maybe it was missing people, but there were faces up there. <laughs> Are you sure those aren't employees of the month? I, I it is Walmart. I, mean, I understand you might think it's employees. You might think it's the you know the missing people, or or maybe if they do work at Walmart, they are missing people. I don't know. But anyway, here's 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 what here's the procedure. The procedure is you go to koanewsradio.com. You click on air. You find my name. You click that. Got me so far? Follow. I, I know this is difficult, but you can do it. I know you can do it. And then once you get to my show page, and you see that wonderful, wonderful, handsome, young-looking guy there, across the bottom you'll see YouTube, Twitter, Facebook. You click each one of those, and on YouTube you subscribe, on Twitter you follow, and on Facebook you like. YouTube you subscribe, Twitter you follow, Facebook you like. And then your job will be done for the evening, other than to sit back, pour a nice glass of, I don't know, a gin and tonic or just a nice bourbon or what I like is keep a bottle of tequila in your freezer. I'm, I'm serious now. Put a bottle of tequila in your freezer, keep it there, and then to listen to this program properly, you'll take that bottle of tequila out. Now, get, don't get a Blanco, like a cheap, you know, clear tequila. Get a really nice Anejo, get, get really a Respado or something, and, and but just get a really nice tequila. Keep it in the freezer, and then when the show comes on, no ice. Just pour whatever's an appropriate amount for you, which I'm not, I, I don't judge, but whatever's an appropriate amount of tequila for you, and then a twist of lime. That's all you need. Now, when the show goes to four hours on December 3rd, you'll need to repeat this four times. So that by the time we get to 10 o'clock at night for that last hour, <laughs> you won't give a rat's ass what I say. Uh-uh, not at all. But then I probably won't either because I'm doing exactly the same thing in the studio. The other thing I want you to mark down is the text line. Angie and I finally got our credentials today. So now we can actually go to the text line and we can read your texts. So... If there's something you want to say to me while I'm going through a story or I'm ranting or raving about something, you can just text me at 56690. 56690 is the text line. And just like the emails, oh, by the way, Michael Brown at KOANewsradio.com. No, no Michael dot Brown, just Michael Brown at KOANewsradio.com. You can email me the old-fashioned way. As I've said before, I'll say it again, I read every single email, even the nasty grams. Now, I don't want a nasty gram, but I do read the nasty grams, and then I usually chuckle at them, and then I file them away because, well, then you go on the list that, well, I won't tell you about that list. Uh, So we got the text line, we got the email, we got the koanewsradio.com, you've got the schedule for this week, which is a grueling schedule. I don't know whether we can manage this or not, Angie. Tonight and Wednesday night? It's pretty rough, I know. Oh, holy cow. Well, you know what's really rough? It's Tamara. Tamara's fed up with the schedule. She was like, I thought you were going to be gone every night. Now you keep showing up. Yep, I lead a charmed, charmed life. By the way, 
uh, speaking of Tamara, if I ever not show up one night and uh, like I don't show up for several days and you think that I have been perhaps murdered, Alexa, play back Michael Brown's murder. Well, Angie, I need some computer hotness over here. Can I get some computer hotness? Uh, try again. Okay. Millions of Americans have them, and state prosecutors hope one of them contains crucial evidence in a double murder case. Alexa comes with a price. <laughs> Timothy Verrill is accused of murdering 48-year-old Christine Sullivan and 32-year-old Jenna Pellegrini. Authorities say they were stabbed to death at this Farmington home in January of 2017. As Verrill awaits trial, a judge has granted the state's request to access recordings of an Amazon Echo Smart speaker, which was in the kitchen at the time Christine Sullivan was killed. I think most people probably don't even realize that Alexa is uh, taking account of what's going on in your house in addition to responding to your demands and commands. UNH law professor Albert Schur says this is becoming more common. Prosecutors believe the Echo, which uses Alexa voice commands, might have recorded audio of the moment Sullivan was attacked, as well as the removal of her body. State police have the speaker, and now the judge is telling Amazon to turn over the recordings from its server. The Attorney General's office was smart not to just say, hey, we got possession of Alexa, the, the dot, so to speak. We can get, do whatever we want with it. They were smart to get uh, an order from the court. Amazon says it won't release any customer information until a valid legal demand has been properly served. Well, I, I would say that a subpoena is a valid legal demand, but I'm not going to quibble with this guy. But it raises the question of, I thought that Amazon assured us that Alexa was only listening for the Q word, Alexa, or Goober, or whatever you've trained yours to say. And that Alexa wasn't always listening except for that keyword. I don't know in this case whether, you know, as the person is getting into the fight, they scream, Alexa, record everything. I, I don't know the details. I don't really want to know the details because I have an Alexa down in my studio at home in my office. And I use it usually to say, Alexa, play KOA News Radio. That's what you should train yours to do, too, by the way. I just found it fascinating that all of a sudden Alexa is in the middle of a murder case because it may have recorded the murder. Yeah. <laughs> maybe we need to take maybe we need to uh, take the advice of some of these spooks and that say we need to put the duct tape over our cams on our laptops and we need to get the Alexas and the Google Home and whatever the AirPod or HomePod or whatever it is that Apple does now, that they're all recording us. Imagine if we had a, uh, uh, I don't know, a whiteness training program, how to be white. Can you imagine what everybody, the NAACP would be screaming, everybody would be screaming at us. Well, listen to this email. This comes from Humboldt University. The subject line is whiteness training. <laughs> It's dated November 6. Dear colleagues, all faculty are encouraged to participate in the upcoming two-part whiteness and microaggressions training on Thursday, November 15 and Friday, November 16 from 2 to 4 p.m. both days. The whiteness and microaggressions training dates were selected with input that more faculty would be available during these times. This four-hour workshop, divided into two two-hour segments, will offer an introduction to the concept of whiteness the significance of whiteness in our everyday lives and how whiteness shapes our interactions. The training examines how whiteness affects various systems of advantage, of advantage and what that looks like in our community. Additionally, it will explore how microaggressions are a manifestation of whiteness. I guess just being white is now racist. And if you're, you know, it used to be that Somebody would scream that the cops were, um, you were stopped, uh, you know, DWB, driving while black. I guess now I'm in trouble for BWW, broadcasting while white. The email continues. Finally, the training will examine strategies to confront and avoid committing microaggressions. Can you imagine on this program if I decided that I'm going to try to avoid every single possible potential microaggression? 
The program would sound something like this. Yeah, exactly. Uh, The email finally finishes, we welcome you to participate and join the more than 300 Humboldt University campus and community members that have already participated in these sessions. Your participation will broaden the circle of shared language and understandings to facilitate change for equity and class. What does that mean? What does that mean? Your participation in a whiteness seminar will broaden the circle of shared language and understandings to facilitate change for equity in classrooms, equity on campus, and equity in the community. The facilitators, uh, oh, Meredith, mm -hmm. Uh, Aldemira Reynoso, and here's a place for you to register and stuff. Imagine if we decided to have a university blackness training. Yeah. How to recognize blackness in the classroom. Or Asian. How to recognize Asians in the classroom. Or Indians. How to, how to recognize Indians in the, in the classroom. There would be holy heck to pay. But, oh, whiteness? Nah, no big deal. No big deal whatsoever. If you want to do that, have at it. If you think that sometimes, you know, the... Um, and I, and I hate to make fun of the Los Angeles Police Department because right now, the Los Angeles Fire Department, which I want to talk about in just a second. I want to talk about the Los Angeles Fire Department and something that the president tweeted, I think, over the weekend or sometime. But anyway, it irritated me. So I, I, I hate to mention this about the LAPD, but the LAPD has a problem. If you think that the police department in, in your community is maybe just not up to snuff, is just not really meeting the standards you expect, maybe they're distracted. It's the situation. Imagine going to work with rats running beneath your feet, fleas. Wait a minute, Angie, this sounds like I heart. <laughs> rats running under our feet. Pretty soon they're going to be talking about rats and, and, and cockroaches and, well, have you looked over here on this console? <laughs> all over your pants. Well, one LAPD station is infested with them. NBC4 investigative reporter Joel Grover talked to the officers who say they're worried that this could affect their health and their ability to serve and protect. The LAPD Central Division cordoned off and closed down as the city fumigates for fleas that could carry disease. Have a lot of cops been bitten by fleas? Yes. This LAPD cop, whose identity and voice are being disguised for fear of retaliation, says the flea infestation began way back in August. They're in the desk drawers, on the floor, in the patrol cars. In one case, the employee looked down at his pants and noticed it was covered with at least 15 fleas on his pants. The L- I, I love how these are cops. These are cops complaining about flea infestations cockroach infestations, rat infestations in their own department, and they have to go behind, you know, where they put the camera in the behind your head, and they put the light in the face, and all you see is the silhouette as the reporter talks to the silhouette, and then they, and then they mess with the voices so you can't understand exactly who it is that's talking. What do the cops fear? Do the cops fear that there's going to be some sort of repercussions against them for complaining that, hey, I looked down and I had 15 fleas in my pants. Hey, I looked down and I had cockroaches crawling up my pant leg. If you're, if you're an LAPD cop and you're afraid to go on camera to complain about cockroaches in your particular station, you might have a lot more serious problem than cockroaches and rats in your department. LAPD confirms to the I-Team that this station, home base for over 300 employees, has a flea and rodent problem. And that's a big problem because fleas that live on rats are actively spreading the typhus bacteria, which has so far infected 109 people in L.A. County this year alone. Holy cow. Flea infestations and cop stations. If 
I can say something to the veterans. Take a moment to say thank you. Make Veterans Day more than just a thank you. We've been thanked over and over and over again. Thank you for your service. Thank you so much. For Ask us where we went. Ask us what we did. KOA News Radio. Ask us what's next in our lives. Sometimes in this business, you meet with the potential sponsor and you immediately connect knowing that this is somebody that if I needed their services, this is who I would turn to. I met one of those people recently, personal injury attorney Mark Simon. He personifies my view of what great lawyers should be, compassionate, caring, hardworking, and tenacious. We're bombarded with attorney ads on radio and television. Let me tell you why you should hire Mark Simon because I would. His deep conviction about caring for his clients stems from his background as a registered nurse. My respect stems from his experience. He takes only cases that are legitimate, where people have been denied just compensation for their injuries, and he does the work himself. As a lawyer, that means a lot to me. So if you, a friend, or a family member has been hurt in an accident or work or anywhere, call the lawyer I would call, Mark Simon, 303-321-HURT. 303-321-HURT, or visit coloradolawyer.net. That's coloradolawyer.net. Hi, this is Dave Logan to talk about Trice Jewelers. Did you know that in her lifetime, a woman looks at her diamond ring over a million times? So, fellas, Trice Jewelers is here to help you find that unique diamond ring that will make her smile a million times. They've just got a great store. With their in-house design center, you're guaranteed to have a unique kind of diamond ring and, of course, they always back it up with the Trice Lifetime Warranty. It's easy and fun to create your own diamond ring as well. Trice has design technology that other stores, frankly, just don't have. So the ring gets a million looks, of course, but it doesn't need to cost a million. With their in-house design center, that means you'll get the quality without the additional extras other stores add on. And that's because they have to send their work out to some trade shop, not at Trice. All the work is performed right in their store by incredibly talented master jewelry craftsmen. Trice Jewelry. For 60 years on University just south of Arapahoe Road. And believe me, you simply can't find a better diamond at a lower price anywhere else, including the Internet. TriceJewelers.com. It used to be when you moved, you called a real estate agent. Today, you call a property manager. Why? Because renting is the new selling. And Renters Warehouse has made renting so easy and affordable, it's crazy to do it any other way. Renters Warehouse perfectly prices your house. They find great tenants in just 17 days on average. And for one low monthly flat fee, their professional landlords manage your property 24-7. They collect the rent. They handle the maintenance requests. They'll even warranty your renters for up to 18 months. With Renters Warehouse, there's no other upfront fees or binding contracts and you can cancel at any time renters warehouse has totally redefined the industry making renting easy fast and worry free for regular folks like you go to renterswarehouse.com right now to book a free home rental price analysis and see what your home will rent for because you can't buy happiness but you can rent it find out how much your home When was the last time you smiled with confidence and pride? Can't remember because it's been so long. Put your dental problems behind you and get back to smiling confidently and eating the foods that you used to love. Hi, it's April. Clear Choice Dental Implant Center delivers a convenient, comfortable dental implant treatment experience to Coloradans looking for a long-term solution to their dental health issues. You know, many patients say that dental implants feel and function just like real teeth. You'll be able to eat, talk, and smile again with comfort and confidence. There's no slip Flipping, readjusting, reapplying adhesives, or taking them out every night like dentures. Dental implants don't cover your palate, so you can continue to taste the foods that you love. For more information, visit clearchoice.com or call 888-234-7568 and schedule a free, no-obligation consultation. That's clearchoice.com or call 888-234-7568. But get back out there with dental implants from Clear Choice Dental Implant Center and tell them that April sent you. KOA News Radio. An iHeart Radio station. KOA News Radio time is 725. Good evening. I'm Roger Criddlebaugh. President Trump is approving a major disaster declaration for California as they deal with deadly wildfires. In a tweet tonight, Trump said he wanted to respond quickly in order to alleviate some of the incredible suffering going on in the state. 
The major disaster declaration will allow more federal emergency funds to flow into California. Meanwhile, a California native and Denver Bronco, Domita Pecco, said today in the Broncos locker room, his family is safe as the deadly wildfires continue to burn in parts of California. Pecco offered his thoughts to those affected by the deadly fires, while at the same time trying to turn his attention to the Broncos game against the Chargers in L.A. on Sunday. For me, i got a whole bunch of fans, a whole bunch of family and friends coming, so I'm excited about that. And, uh, man, it's good to get back to Cali. Peckel grew up in Whittier, California, about 20 miles from the stadium where the Broncos will play the Chargers. Coverage on KOA News Radio begins Sunday morning at 8 with Broncos warm-up. The kickoff is set for 2.05. A tale of two towns this morning was rocking with snow and left a lot behind. Up in the Seven Hills area of Boulder, it's about four miles to the west of Boulder up in the hills, more than a foot of snow. Genesee, 14 inches of snow. Tiny Town, 14 inches. Southwest Boulder at Baseline and Broadway had more than a foot of snow. And Nederland had more than a foot of snow. That's CBS 4's Ashton Altieri. He says all that snow that fell in the metro area, you might not see any of it. Come. Come Wednesday. Our next update at 8, I'm Roger Crittlebaugh on KOA News Radio, 850 AM and 941 FM. Now traffic and weather together with Bill Jones. Well, your drive's looking uh, very good right now. I-270, we had an earlier crash uh, westbound at York. That was stop and go all the way back to I-70. That's gone, completely gone, and traffic is flowing smoothly through there. We had another crash, I-70 eastbound at Peoria. That's been wiped out as well, and traffic is flowing smoothly east and westbound on I-70 all the way through town. A crash northbound I-25 at 6th Avenue likewise has been cleared. We do have one off-highway accident down south in Parker at Lincoln and Jordan Road. CBS 4 weather mostly clear tonight with a low down around 18. Tomorrow, Tuesday, sunny and warmer, a high in the mid-40s. In Denver right now, it is 18 degrees. This report is sponsored by Zero, beautiful accounting software that's powered by people with zero small businesses and their accountants. Can collaborate from anywhere at any time with real-time financials, bank connections, unlimited users, online invoicing, and payments. It's beautiful accounting software that's powered by people. Zero.com slash join. Bill Jones, KOA News Radio, Colorado's news traffic and weather station. I've bought more guns at one place than any other place in my life, and that's at 14th and Arapahoe in Boulder. Gunsport is our kind of store, and I think that's where you ought to be buying your firearms too. You're going to find quality firearms and knives. They've got a large selection of ammo, scopes, holsters, books. They buy, sell, trade, and they take consignment. Gunsport is family owned and they treat us like family. A family run business where they focus on atmosphere and they focus on us. Everybody from the old hard gun vets to the person that's never shot before, Ross the owner and Jason his son, are going to treat us all the same. They've got rare ammo, collector's guns, you name it, they've got it where they can get it. So I want you to drive up to Boulder and see for yourself why I've spent more money at Gunsport than any other single location. 14th and Arapahoe in Boulder. You can't miss this grand old building. Trust me, once you turn the corner, you'll understand why. And once you go inside, you'll understand why I love this place. 14th and Arapahoe or online, gunsport.us. And when you go, tell them Michael Brown sent you. Hey, what's up, guys? Emmanuel Sanders here. There's an expectation in pro football that big time players will deliver big plays. It's the same at Ortho Colorado Hospital. I'm Dr. William Peace, a board certified orthopedic surgeon at Ortho Colorado Hospital and a flight surgeon for the Colorado Air National Guard. We are honored when people choose our family of experts to help them get back to doing the things they love. To learn more, visit orthocolorado.org slash don't. Wait. Ortho Colorado, Colorado's only orthopedic hospital, part of Centura Health. If you plan on selling a home, listen to this important message from Rex. There's no longer any reason to pay 6% to sell your home. Introducing Rex. Rex sells homes for the lowest fee in the industry, 2% total, saving consumers thousands of dollars per transaction. With Rex, you get a full-service team backed by technology. They don't market homes the way traditional agents do. Rex uses a data-driven process to attract hundreds of qualified buyers directly to your home the moment it goes on the market. And Rex charges only 2% total, not the 6% commission your local broker expects. To get started, call now at 720-586-4006. For a limited time, new sellers receive an additional $500 home improvement gift card for signing up with Rex. Sign up today. Offer expires 1130. To get started, call now at 720-586-4006. 
License number 1000 500 promotion subject to listening going live on the market and may require a designated listening start date. It's time for podcasters to get the recognition they deserve. Introducing the iHeartRadio Podcast Awards presented by Capital One. Over 20 categories like crime, comedy, music, sports, curiosity, and more. Cast your vote and you're automatically qualified to join us in person for the first ever iHeartRadio Podcast Awards. Vote now at iHeartPodcastAwards.com. Capital One is the proud presenting partner of the iHeartRadio Podcast Awards. Just another example of the great products, rewards, service, and access to unique and unforgettable experiences they bring to their customers. Back to Michael Brown on KOA News Radio and streaming live at KOAnewsradio.com. Can you feel it? Now it's coming back. We can steal it. If we bridge this gap, I can see you. The Associated Press has declared that uh, Democrat Kirsten Sinema is the winner of the tightly contested Senate race down in Arizona. Loser is Congressman Martha McSally. I find that interesting simply because if history, if, I, if I'm correct on my history, Every single recount that has ever occurred, I shouldn't say ever occurred, but every single recount that I can recall in Arizona history has resulted in what was the presumptive Republican winning to that being overturned and a Democrat winning. Now, I don't want to imply that there's anything nefarious going on in Arizona, but Arizona, a lot like Colorado, Maricopa County, which is where Phoenix sits, is where about 60% of Arizona voters live. And while Maricopa County, that's the home of former Sheriff Joe Arpaio, while it is traditionally a conservative area, it too is undergoing a demographic change, much like we are in Colorado. I just find it fascinating that when you look at the history of recounts throughout almost all of American history, rarely does a recount change the outcome of an election. You have to be down to less than 500, 300 votes for a recount to really make a difference and upset or you know, turn around the results of an election. That's why no matter how many sh- how much shenanigans are going on in Florida, and I think there's a lot of shenanigans going on in Florida, no matter how much there is, I really don't think that ultimately, despite how much some of these, uh, oh, what do they call them, their, their election offices, we call them the Secretary of State's office, county clerks here, um, supervisor of elections is what they call them in, Arizona, in Florida. In Broward and West Palm Beach counties in Florida, both of which were involved in the Bush Gore recount in 2000. That th- those two counties were the epicenter of the recounts. You got a lot of shenanigans going on. Deadlines not being complied with, reporters not being let in to watch something which is a purely public process. But I think truthfully when when all of the recounting and the lawsuits and the litigation and everything is done in Florida, I think DeSantis will still be the governor, will be the governor elect, and I think uh, Scott will be the senator-elect. You just rarely see recounts overturning what are the initial results unless it is... Now, I, I, I can't speak to uh, city council elections. I can't speak to dog catcher elections, but presidential elections, congressional elections, senatorial elections, gubernatorial elections, rarely, if ever, do recounts overturn what the initial ballot count showed. Which is why I think I find in Arizona it particularly interesting because it seems that every statewide contest in Arizona that has been subject to a recount, it has flipped from Republican to Democrat, which goes against the statistical average that you would see nationwide in every other state. It makes it makes me think. Uh, if you think Chicago, Cook County, Illinois, if you think that Cook County, Illinois is or was the most corrupt uh, county in the country, seems to me that Palm Beach County, 
Broward County in Florida and maybe Maricopa County in Arizona are giving them a run for their money. I just, I find it fascinating. I wrote an article today for The Hill magazine. You can find it at thehill.com. The headline they put on it, I don't write the headlines, I just write the stories. Michael Brown says, don't debate forestry management in the middle of a disastrous wildfire. And my point was this. I know the president tweeted out earlier this weekend, sometime over the weekend, that California shouldn't get any federal help because California doesn't properly manage the wild land, the uh, urban wild land interface. The, the urban wild land interface could best be described as that area, if you're familiar with the area around Denver and the Front Range, that area along 470, west of, of Denver. When you look up to that area, up Genesee, up all of the, the area back up in there, that's the wildland urban interface where the urban area is spreading into the forest areas. But the same is true on the eastern plains. You have a wildland urban interface where urban areas move into the prairie, move into the grasslands. And when those things happen and a disaster occurs, like a wildfire, whether it's a forest fire or a grass fire, the damage caused by those fires exponentially increases the more urbanization that you have. We had these horrible floods in Colorado back in 2013. The damage was off the charts. The Colorado State geologists, though, came out because everybody was screaming, oh, look how much worse things are getting because of climate change. Well, actually, things weren't getting worse because of climate change. And the state geologist in Colorado pointed out that exactly almost 100 years ago, in 1813, there were similar floods that came down the Big Thompson, came down the St. Vrain River, came down all these, these are flood areas, these are, these are river basins along the Front Range in Colorado, for those of you listening somewhere else. And they, they spread out across the plains. They come through Denver and Longmont and Fort Collins and Loveland. Well, if the floods were essentially the same 100 years ago as they were in 2013, yet the damage in 1813 was nominal, the damage in 2013 was astronomical, what, what's the difference? What's the delta? What, what, what would cause that difference? Well, it's easy to understand when you have urbanization, when you have an influx of population, you have, and that population comes and it brings homes, businesses, infrastructure, highways, roads, bridges, everything else. And so as areas get built up, when the floods come through or the fires come through, that means the damage numbers are going to be higher than they were 10 years ago or 20 years ago or 100 years ago. You can't say there's a causal link between the damage that is caused by a disaster today and climate change. You can't say the fires are worse. I know that personally. In 2003, there were fires that were just as horrific as the ones we see today occurred in 2003, but in the San Diego area. They, it wiped out just like Malibu's being wiped out. It wiped out incredibly expensive housing areas out in and around San Diego. But 2003, for most Americans, is ancient history. And we don't think about it in those terms. Oh, yeah, this just happened like 15 years ago. The point of my article in The Hill magazine today, you can find it at thehill.com, just search my name, is that if the president wants to chastise California for not properly managing its forest areas, that's fine. Just don't do it while firefighters and smoke jumpers are risking their lives to protect property and save lives. There's a time and a place to chastise California. And look, I... 
I'd be the first to chastise California in a New York minute. But I'm not going to do it while firefighters are putting their lives at risk. I'm not going to do it while a quarter of a million people are trying to evacuate and save their own lives, save their property. That's not the time to debate, hey, are we properly managing our forests? And I don't think we properly manage our forests. Think about this. Every hunter listening to me right now understands this. We manage wildlife. We allow the killing of Bambi. Because we know that if we don't allow hunters to kill Bambi, there will become too many Bambis, and they will become disease-infected, they will overrun neighborhoods, they will destroy property, it will be apocalyptic. So we manage wildlife by having hunting season and allowing people to go out and kill Bambi. Now, if if you don't hunt, and you'd rather pet Bambi, then you really don't understand wildlife management. The same is true of forest areas or grassland areas or prairies. If you don't properly manage that area, look, there are a lot of people who say that we should allow forests to just grow naturally and then burn naturally. You know, if Mother Nature decides to have a lightning strike, just let it burn. The problem with doing that is if you have an urban wildlife interface and you don't manage the the fuel that ends up growing in those areas, you'll have catastrophic wildfires. And I think we should better manage our forests. I just don't think the president ought to chastise California while they're in the middle of fighting disastrous fires. So anyway, you can find that article at thehill.com. It's, uh, well, you should enjoy the comments because you'll find that, um, just like in this audience, some people really like me and some people really hate me. Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez is the youngest person ever to be elected to Congress. She's a millennial. She's worried about paying the rent. Seriously. She has told the New York Times that between now and when she takes office in January as one of, well, as, as the state, as America's youngest congressperson, she doesn't know how she's going to afford her rent in Washington, D.C. And I've I mean, I'm sorry, but I find this hilarious. This woman has a degree in economics. She has a degree in economics, and she can't figure out how she's going to pay the... Look, rents in Washington, D.C. are exorbitant. But you can find a basement apartment on Capitol Hill. I forget what I paid when I lived in a basement apartment on Capitol Hill. We called it the dump. Tamara refused to stay there when she came to see me. We had to go stay at the hotel because I'm not staying in that dump. We literally called it the dump. But think about this. Here you have someone who has a degree in economics that's about to become a U.S. congressman, and she can't figure out how she's going to pay her rent. And she has a degree in economics. I've got a suggestion. You're going to be making, as a congressman, a minimum of $174,000 a year. Now, if you'd like to be making $174,000 a year, raise your hand. You just need to become a congressman. If you're, if you're about to embark upon a two-year job, the voters just gave you a two-year contract at $174,000 a year. And so what you need, you want to move to Washington, D.C. right now, you won't collect your first government paycheck as a congressman if let's say let's say you start January 3rd or 4th whatever the first day is and you won't get your first paycheck until February so you need what 3 months so you need $6000 i even i would loan her the money you know why cuz i know she has a guaranteed income of $174,000 a year for the next 2 years. I don't think there's a bank in the, in the country that wouldn't loan her $6,000, $8,000, $10,000 for her to put down a deposit and rent an apartment for the next 3 months until she gets her first congressional paycheck. I don't think there's a bank in the country that wouldn't give her a loan. They know where she works. They can garnish her check if she doesn't pay. She's got the guaranteed income, and she can't figure it out. I can't decide whether she's 
begging somebody to start a GoFundMe campaign for her, or she really is just that stupid. I really can't figure it out. There's another, too much, too many California stories tonight, but I got to tell you this story. There's a community in California called Seal Beach, and they've been helping the owner of their local donut shop. The owner of the donut shop, his wife, is sick. I think she's terminally ill. They have decided that every single day they're going to go in and they're going to buy all of his products so he can close early and go home and take care of his wife. Donut City is the name of his place. It's on the Pacific Coast Highway. It's been there for almost 30 years. But a few weeks ago, some of the regular customers noticed that part of the duo, the husband and wife team, was missing. John, the husband, was still there boxing and bagging donuts behind the counter, but Stella, his wife, was nowhere to be found. She had suffered an aneurysm at the end of September, and she was unable to communicate and move for several weeks. She has started to speak slowly again, but she can't come back to work. And when some of the customers finally found out from John, who didn't want to talk about it, what was going on, somebody told the Orange County Register, and so all of these people started showing up to buy out all of his inventory so he could shut down his store and go home and take care of his wife. Now, you tell me that America is still not the greatest place in the world to live. Oof. I'd like to think that somebody would do that for a neighbor in, in your community, wherever you are. I read this. By the way, somebody text me, 56690. That's our text line. We, we've changed the text number since we moved over here to KOA. You can text me during the show. You hear me say something you like, dislike. You hear me say something you think is outrageous or incorrect or you want to just, you just want to say hi. Send me a text to 56690. The reason I'm asking you to do that is because I'm logged in and I can't quite figure out how to exactly get this. It's, it's a, Angie, have you looked at it? It doesn't read like it does over the, uh, the other number did. Yeah, it does. Does it? Then yeah, I'm it doing, does. Then, then I'm doing something wrong. You're doing something wrong. I know you find that hard to believe, but I might be doing something wrong. What? Do we, have we gotten texts? Yeah. Seriously? Yeah. I can't find them. Aww. I know you don't care. Sounds like a personal problem. It is a personal problem. I've often said, for those of you who have listened to me before on, on that other station, for those of you who listened to me before, I've talked about how you and I, it doesn't make any difference what your political affiliation is. It doesn't make any difference what your, what, what, whether you're liberal, conservative. It doesn't make any difference what your, your political inclination is. Or for that matter, your sexual preferences or whether you identify as a male or a female or you identify as a goober or whatever it is. It doesn't make any difference. What does matter is that you are a discerning consumer of news. Because there's too much stuff on radio and television magazines, websites, wherever you turn for your news, there's too much stuff that is just twisted. It's twisted one direction or the other direction, or they misstate facts or they leave something out. Over the weekend, I'm reading a story about how California Senator Diane. see, there's another California story, sick of California, where California Senator Dianne Feinstein had urged then-President Obama to use the very broad power granted him by Congress to limit immigration, that she had written a letter to him urging him to use his broad powers as president, executive orders in other words, to fix immigration, to limit immigration. And I found a CNBC story, I found a Daily Caller story, I think I found a Fox News story, And it seems to me there was a fourth one, CNBC, Fox, Daily Caller, and there may have been one, Maybe I I forget where it was, but there were four different stories that referenced this letter that Dianne Feinstein had sent to Barack Obama. I just wanted to read the letter. I didn't want these news sites telling me what the letter said. It's okay if you want to, in your story, tell me what the letter said, but then give me the option myself to actually read the letter and let me see what the letter said. 
None of those four outlets, the one I can't remember and the other three, Daily Caller, CNBC, and Fox News, none of them gave me a hyperlink or any other way for me to actually read the story and to see what it said. And I found that irritating because if I'm going to sit here and try to urge all of you to be discerning consumers of news, then we ought to call out news outlets when they don't allow us to be discerning consumers of news. Don't. It's fine, tell me what the letter said, but then give me the option of reading the letter. It's not as if you're printing a physical newspaper and printing the letter is going to take up too much space. All you have to do is provide a link that takes you to a separate landing page on a, on a website and allow me to read the letter. I dug everywhere. If any of you can find the letter, send me a link. But I couldn't find the letter anywhere. You know that gunman that killed 12 people in the... Another California story. Angela, let's just call it quits now. I got too many stories from California tonight. The gunman that shot the 12 people at the country music bar. Everyone's reporting, including the Wall Street Journal, that there was an interaction between him and the... Was it Sherman Oaks or th- Thousand? No, it was Thousand Oaks. The Thousand Oaks Police Department had interaction with him, but they decided that he was not a threat to himself. Turns out, the more you dig into the story, the more you find out that he might have actually had PTSD, or he might have at least had some mental health problems that would have required more police intervention. This guy killed himself after t- killing 12 people. But apparently, he not only shot a gun inside his mother's apartment, but he was threatening to kill her and himself. Now, I don't know about you, but if somebody, if I, if I lived in, a, in, a part, in an apartment complex, and someone shot a gun, more likely than not, it went through one apartment wall into another apartment wall unless there was a fire wall between the apartment apartments such that the ammo couldn't pierce it but still if you're making threats against your mother and against your own life why wasn't he arrested or why wasn't he confined or why wasn't he red flagged or why wasn't he put on a mental health hold and the bottom line is this Whenever people clamor for additional gun control, we already have laws in place that would have handled someone like this guy. The problem is, we don't use the laws that we have. And when we don't use the laws that we have, clamoring for some sort of gun control, gun confiscation, limits of who can buy guns wherever, however, whatever, it's not going to solve the problem. The problem is inherently not the gun. The problem is the individual that's got the gun. And if we, have, if we have laws in place that would allow us to deal with those people, but for whatever reason we choose not to, then I would say the problem is not with gun control laws. It's with not enforcing the, the laws that we have. <sighs> it's... Those of you know, I'm a, I'm a staunch believer in the Second Amendment. I'm a staunch believer that the Second Amendment is simply an embodiment of a natural law, a natural right that we have to defend ourselves. God intended that we should be able to defend ourselves, defend ourselves, our family, our property against those who would take our lives away, take our property away. And the Second Amendment is simply an embodiment of that natural right. We have that right irrespective of the Second Amendment. If you want the con law class on that, we'll do that some later, sometime later when I've got more time. But the, the whole concept of natural law says that there are certain unalienable rights that we have, irrespective of whether or not they are written out inside the Constitution. And the ability to defend yourself is one of those. And what we have is a culture clash in this country that believes that you should not be able to defend yourself, that that should be the role of law enforcement. And I've always found that fascinating because if someone's breaking into your home 
Or, as in the case of this nut job in California that killed the people in the bar uh, last weekend, we've got to recognize that we have a personal responsibility to defend ourselves, and that relying upon law enforcement to do it is invariably going to end badly. That's pretty much all I got. Ladies and gentlemen, Elvis has left the building. It's time for college basketball. Hi, this is Mark Johnson.